Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus today. I am Trace, and this is episode four of five in our series all about telescopes, about these light buckets that pick up energy from the universe and translate them into data that we can use to learn all about it. So far we've talked about how they work, who invented them, all the different types of telescopes from radio all the way to gamma rays. And today we're gonna talk about what those things have shown us. Yesterday we learned that there are so many different types of telescopes. I mean, there are a lot of different ones. And we didn't even cover all of them. We just covered the general categories of all of them. Because within those categories are even more specific telescopes for learning specific things. Let's talk a bit about these, again, kind of in order of the electromagnetic scale that they're on. If you don't know what the EM scale is, make sure you go back and watch yesterday's episode or a whole series on light. It's really great. But come with me on this. The lowest, most low energy on the EM spectrum is a radio wave. Radio waves are picked up by radio telescopes and they are detecting so much of the universe around us. A radio telescope, if you point it at the sun, for instance, would pick up all sorts of stuff. Solar flares, if they're large enough to explode into the solar system, which are called coronal mass ejections, are a real and constant danger and we use radio telescopes to pick them up because they give off all sorts of energy as they're being created right before they explode off the sun. Mercury was looked at with radio telescopes and it's essentially like a radar. You bounce the waves off of the planet and you can take images of it. Normal ice also absorbs radio waves and ice at extremely low temperatures reflects radio waves. So we can take temperature readings or rough ones using that information. Some images from radio telescopes of Mercury specifically have scientists believing that there might be ice in a planet that's super close to the sun. That's crazy. And we learned this with radio telescopes. Venus has clouds all over it. I don't know if you've seen pictures, it's kind of like a big yellow sulfury mass, but we didn't know that much about Venus because you can't see through the clouds with an optical telescope. You know what you can do? See through it with radio waves. Radio telescopes could see past the clouds and show the surface and it wasn't anything like what we thought and that's crazy, thank you radio telescopes. Just fly through a few more things that radio telescopes have done. Asteroids, we can use radar similar to with Mercury and bounce things off and get measurements of what asteroids look like on their surface. Radio telescopes found belts of radiation surrounding Jupiter that they could pick up. And they also can see within gas giants like Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And you can't do that with an optical telescope because clouds block that part of the EM spectrum. Radio telescopes are also the primary way that we can track space probes that we launch, and the deep space network that we use to communicate with a lot of those probes uses the same principle as a radio telescope. It picks up very faint radio signals from very far away. The SETI project does the same thing. They are listening for alien life. And radio telescopes are also the best way to see things like pulsars and active galaxies like quasars, where they have all sorts of different star formations and really, really awesome stuff. And they all produce radio frequencies as they're being formed. Sometimes radio telescopes are the only way that astronomers can image these things. Radio waves on account of their low energy can travel through a lot of dust and stuff that's flying through the universe so we can paint a really great picture of our galaxy and, and beyond our galaxy into other galaxies. We can also see the birth and death of stars and all sorts of stuff. Radio telescopes, awesome. Infrared telescopes, next on the list, uses that heat radiation, remember, the infrared spectrum. And these things have to do with temperatures. So everything that has a temperature radiates infrared radiation. So using infrared telescopes, we can suck in that radiation and figure out what things are radiating out into the universe. I know it sounds really silly, but essentially we can figure out the heat of a star. We can figure out how much energy it's giving off. And the James Webb telescope is gonna help us with this later. Don't go anywhere. I'm gonna figure that out tomorrow. Make sure you come back. Infrared telescopes are also able to see through things that some other telescopes can't, specifically optical ones, but it's better at seeing some things than radio or gamma. Infrared telescopes do really well with space dust because the heat doesn't get blocked by the dust quite as much as some of the other chunks of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
Astronomers will study infrared wavelengths to gain better understanding of the early universe because the Big Bang was very hot and to learn about objects that are too cold to generate visible light because an absence of that information is also important or a very low amount of it. So brown dwarf stars and dust clouds. We can find hot spots where stars may form. We can see how hot supernovae get. It's, it's really incredible stuff. On top of that, infrared telescopes can tell us how the universe expands. In fact, we used infrared telescopes to discover the expansion theory, the idea that the universe is expanding away from itself. So when you're on a street corner and an ambulance goes by, the Doppler effect makes it sound different from when it's in front of you to when it's past you, right? The sound changes right away. Moving things in the universe do this too, but they're doing it not necessarily with sound, although sound behaves kind of the same way on the EM spectrum. This is called red shifting, and it shifts toward the infrared part of the EM spectrum. So things that are really far away are red shifted, and infrared telescopes are one of the only ways that we can see those infrared things. And by doing so, we can determine how fast and how the universe is expanding. It's really, really cool. Also really complicated. We can talk about it over on Twitter if you want. One of the better known infrared telescopes uh, was the Spitzer Space Telescope. We didn't really talk about this yet, but space telescopes have the advantage of being outside of the atmosphere. The atmosphere doesn't get in the way of the telescope. Ground-based telescopes have the advantage of being accessible to astronomers. You can build more of them more easily. Space telescopes are expensive to get up there, but they can see some things that ground-based can't. Spitzer determined the temperature and atmospheric structure and composition of all sorts of extrasolar planets or exoplanets, planets around other stars. Spitzer looked deep into the universe, so far away that it's looking at the universe kind of in its early stages. Because the further away you look, the further back in time you're looking. It even discovered Saturn's outermost ring, which we didn't know too much about, so Spitzer was able to image that a little better. And since 2009, we haven't been able to use Spitzer because its liquid helium cryogen was depleted. It couldn't stay cold enough to really detect anything. Now we're back up to visible light telescopes. Visible light, our favorite, the human spectrum, if you will. Hubble is our most famous visible light telescope. I don't think I necessarily have to explain to you what you can see with a visible light telescope. You can see visible light, but let me give you some records here. Hubble has made over 1.2 million observations and it's made those observations resulting in over 12,000 scientific papers. Uh, Hubble's observations of supernovae helped reveal the mysterious dark energy that you've probably heard a lot about in science, and so many, so many, so many other things. But it's not the only visible light telescope out there. The Kepler Space Telescope, which is now on the K2 mission, uh, is discovering exoplanets by watching the shadow of planets passing in front of stars you know, m many millions of miles away, light years away. And it's on its what's called the K2 mission because the satellite turns by using these little reaction wheels. So it spins the wheel and that causes the satellite to move. Well, Kepler's are broken, so it can't actually move that well. But what it can do is point in a single direction and in that single direction, it's discovered many hundreds of potential exoplanets, which is really awesome. There's also ground-based telescopes like the Lowell Observatory in Arizona, where I just was this week, uh, preparing for more videos about this telescope special. It's coming up on the Discovery Channel on February 20th at nine. Put that on your calendar. But there they discovered Pluto in the 1930s using visible light. Actually saw the telescope. They still have it there on display. So obviously we're biased towards these visible light telescopes. I said this yesterday, I'm gonna say it again today. They're kind of boring. Like visible light's cool, but if I put my eye on a telescope, it makes me excited. If I can put an infrared inferometer on a telescope, I can pick up all sorts of information that my eye just doesn't know how to process. So we're moving on. X-ray telescopes, also super cool. And we've gotten a lot better at building these because they're kind of complicated. And the sharper that we can get with the X-ray telescope, the more we can understand the distribution of gases in galaxies and in between galaxies, especially hot ones. We can understand the physics of supernovae and how they expand after they explode, all sorts of other cool stuff. Recently, we learned comets actually emit a little bit of X-rays and binary star systems, 
which by the way are 50% of all stars that you can see in, you know, when you're standing out at night, 50% of them are binary, which means there are two stars orbiting each other. They emit a lot of X-rays as well. Gamma ray telescopes, the highest energy of the EM spectrum, is a little more difficult to quantify for a lot of people because it's a detector more than a telescope, right? But the Fermi Large Area Telescope scans the entire sky every three hours and detects photons with energies ranging from 20 million to more than 300 billion times the energy of visible light that comes into your eye. And in 2008, the Fermi Telescope discovered the very first pulsar that only beams in gamma rays. A pulsar, by the way, it's a rapidly spinning neutron star. It's a star that's collapsed and it's super dense and powerful, like a teaspoon of it is so heavy, I don't even remember, it's crazy, look it up. They're really, really dense. But pulsars usually emit radio waves, but this one, for some reason, emits gamma rays. I have no idea how useful they can be. Gamma rays are cool, though. And that's how we got the Hulk. Sidebar. Anyway, so that's all the different types of EM radiation and what they can do for us. Astronomers want to suck in as much of this as possible and get as many different types of radiation as possible to get a better picture. Imagine if you were only able to use the visible spectrum. We wouldn't learn all of these different things. So the more telescopes we build, both on the ground and in space, the better picture of the universe we're going to have. The thing is, we aren't seeing the whole picture even still. We're still hoping to find all sorts of cool stuff with telescopes in the future. So come back tomorrow to learn more about that with TestTube Plus. You can come find us on Twitter at TestTube. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Let us know down in the comments if you have a favorite type of telescope. I'm going to go x-ray, I think. It's pretty cool. Thanks for watching. I'm Trace. We'll see you next time.